Good. Hey guys, how's everyone doing today? So that's it. All right, I want to hear way more energy than that. All right, How, good morning, everybody. All right. Oh, you can do better than that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I know it's Friday, but really. <laughs> All right. Okay, welcome. Over. Just to make sure you're in the right talk, which I know you guys are, <laughs> it's Killer Portfolio or Killer. Wait. <laughs> portfolio killer. Killer. It's up there. <laughs> it, it's that. Um, if everybody can actually turn off your cell phones, that would be awesome. And let's begin. All right, my name is Allison Kelly, and I'm a consultant to top tier gaming companies. And we'll start from with Sean. And also, if you could, Sean, start with what is your number one pet peeve that you see with portfolios? <laughs> wow. Um, all right, well, let me, I'll start with my name. Uh, Sean Robertson, I was animation director on Bioshock Infinite, uh, lead animator on Bioshock. I'm currently art director on uh, Ken Levine's current project, the Negative Lara, uh, Lego uh, thing that he had talked about at GDC a couple years ago. I think biggest pet peeve for me on portfolios is uh, lack of presentation, um, hiding what could potentially be really good art behind uh, really bad presentation of that art. Hmm. Uh, I'm Gavin Goulden. I'm the lead character artist for Insomniac Games. I uh, just worked on Sunset Overdrive. Uh, we're working on Ratchet and Clank, um, Edge of Nowhere. Uh, prior to that, I was with Sean, working on Bioshock Infinite. Uh, you want my, my pet peeve, too? Yeah. Your pet peeve, please. I, I have so many, though. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I would say having a game art portfolio with no game art in it, basically just having a lot of uh, really nice ZBrush sculpts, but no no technical pieces in a game engine, no game art, no textures, just, uh, just pretty sculpts. All right, I'm Greg Furch. Uh, I'm an art director of Fraxis. I have my most recent stuff was XCOM 2 and XCOM Enemy Unknown. Um, my biggest pet peeve, I'm like, I'm like Gavin, I got so many. Um, so like, uh, I guess the, the biggest thing is, is when I see a portfolio that has stuff that potentially looks good, but it's it's not shown in a way that I can actually see it. Um, so uh, you know, a good example if you have an environment piece, um, you know, if if you just give me a, a screenshot and I have no idea what anybody did or or or, or what's yours or being able to break it out, um, it kind of makes it a little confusing to, to to understand what's actually happening and your thought process. That's kind of my biggest thing. Mm -hmm. My name is Steve Scott. Uh, I work at Bungie up in Seattle. I'm the special effects art lead. Uh, our most recent title was Destiny of the Taken King. And uh, my biggest pet peeve for looking at portfolios is that I do not receive nearly enough effects portfolios. <laughs> They're very scarce. <laughs> Uh, I'm Wyeth Johnson. Uh, I've been at Epic Games for 10 years now. Um, I've held a number of different roles, uh, art lead, art director, technical art lead. Um, and I think my biggest pet peeve is probably when I like something from somebody's, but I can't do what I want with it. So a good example would be a Flash portfolio that I can't just right click, save as, put it in a folder, somebody I want to look at, somebody maybe I'm interested in, but they're not quite ready and I want to follow up. You know, the difficulties accessing the content on your site is, drives me nuts. You know, I, I want to be able to right click, save your images, put them where I want them, uh, you know, copy out your information, get a really, really quick PDF of your resume, all that kind of stuff, put it right there in my face and let me do what I want with the stuff on your site. Okay, Greg, is it true that AAA companies don't hire recent grads, and if so, why? Um, you know, I, I don't know that that really uh, is, is something that's locked solid. I think it's different every uh, studio you go to. But, um, I mean, you know, the biggest thing is a lot of times I think uh, uh, people who are entering the industry get, get turned off by the, you know, we want five years' experience or three years' experience. Um, you know, the bottom line, honestly, I mean, that does matter. But all that matters is your work. Like the first thing I do when I get a link is I look at your work. The second thing I do is I look at your work. The third thing I do is I may look at your name uh, and your resume. So like if the work is good, I, I'm not going to know that you have five years experience or three years experience or a year of experience or none 
until I actually get to your resume. So like the portfolio is all that matters. All that matters is the work. And so, you know, I've seen people that are coming out of school that perform, you know, like somebody who's got three or five years experience. Um, you know, it, it just doesn't matter. I've, I've seen the reverse. You know, guys who have multiple years experience and it doesn't look like they have that year's experience. So, um, you know, don't get caught up on those things because, again, you can't control that stuff. You can control your, your work. And um, that's honestly, the artwork is all that matters. Or would you even say a lot of students get hung up on writing these big resumes mm -hmm. that worked at, you know, a movie theater? In the end, like you said, you don't care about yeah. the content on the resume. It's all about your work. Well, I mean, the content it, it needs to be relevant, mm -hmm. right? So, like, you know, like, uh, it should be the things that you've done that, that would have um, an interest to the person hiring you, no matter whether you're looking for a game job or any other job. But... But, uh, but yeah, it should be it should be more relevant, and it, it matters. But that's again, that's like for me, that's the third tier. I don't know what your gender is or nationality is, or I don't care. You can be purple as long as you can help my game. Um, that's all that matters. And so, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, just focus on the thing that matters. And uh, but uh, make sure your resume is clean, though. Clean, yeah. Uh, a lot of students also seem to focus on the tools heavily. Uh, which none of us care at all about. <laughs> I will teach you any tool in three months. I don't care if you're, you know, Max, like the back of your hand, and, oh, I'm weak in Maya, and I'm stressing about my Photoshop thing. Do not care. It's only about the finished product, the stuff that's in the portfolio that's game art, just like Gavin said. Pretty sculpts are pretty much meaningless. Uh, but if you have a great portfolio that has really good game art in it, I do not care what tools you know. Put them in there just in case we were kind of curious what we might be dealing with, but... You know, it shouldn't be half your portfolio is, oh, I'm really good at Excel. I don't, <laughs> I, none of us care. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wyatt, this actually brings me to a topic that you always are drilling down. It's all about quality, not quantity. Yes. Portfolios. So talk to me about it. Oh, it's crazy important. Uh, and, and actually, um, a better way to couch that conversation, I think, is... Um, you know, you're only as strong as the weakest thing in your portfolio. And you, ha the reason we always say quality over quantity is because what happens is, is people end up hiding their weaknesses at the end of a strong portfolio. We see it all the time. They kind of arc from an amazingly good introductory piece and it tapers down. And what we're always going to do is just flip to the last page first and look at what we think you, mentally you believe is the weakest thing on your portfolio. Because you're going to hide it. You're going to, ah, maybe they won't make it to the end. Trust me, we're going to look at the last piece first. And you're only, you know, what happens is, is we question your quality bar. We question your taste level, right? Because if you have a really, really strong piece, maybe that was one that you worked on for a long time or you vetted with the community. Maybe you got feedback from your peers. But maybe you went off into the corner just to fill your portfolio with more stuff and there's some weak stuff in there that you weren't able to edit out. You couldn't see it for yourself. And so you always have to be editing your portfolio and constantly culling the stuff that's weak so that we're only seeing the strongest thing. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll second that. I think the uh, the weakest part of your portfolio is going to leave the lasting um, impression. This may be a dumb metaphor, but think about a nice meal. Somebody brings you a nice steak meal. It's got, like, you know, potatoes and a nice cooked steak, and then there's a fly on top of that. And you're going to focus on the fly. You're not going to focus on the steak. Um, like I said, not a perfect metaphor. But I think pulling back and pulling away, like, rather than showing 15 pieces that are, you know, 10 good and 5 mediocre, leave the mediocre ones out. Let us be interested in what else you have rather than showing everything up front. Um, it's about a story of, of the artwork that you're creating and leave us wanting, you know, the curiosity like, oh, what else does this person have? I'd like to see more rather than, oh, they put all this like really bad stuff in so I, I kind of get a sense where this is going. We've hired junior environment artists that had two pieces in their portfolio. They had two environments, three images each, and they got hired. So, Steve, how important, how important is my general presentation, and what can a person do to improve upon it? Uh, I th it's mostly important. As these guys will tell you, it's, it's the content that we're going to be looking at. Uh, but the presentation is going to impact our perception of that quality. Uh, if Well, imagine... 
a game with a really bad UI and a really bad uh, introductory experience, but really good gameplay. It's hard to get into that and to find that quality, right? Portfolios are the same way. So if, uh, why have you mentioned uh, a flash presentation that you can't right click and save on those assets, uh, it, it's going to be really challenging for us to be able to like drill down and, and really consider that work if, if we can't access it. Uh, in terms of improving, um, well. Make it work. Make it work. Um, <laughs> test it out on your friends. Uh, have them look at it on their browsers or different uh, formats. Uh, do you guys have any other ideas for how to improve that? Well, I will say a, a Tumblr blog is not a portfolio. Uh, that's such a common thing where people are posting their work and it's kind of timeline based and it almost feels stream of consciousness. I don't see, you know, the, the first thing that any of us see should be your absolute greatest thing you've ever done. And a Tumblr blog is the exact opposite of that, right? Where it's just a timeline of things that are happening. I'm interested in that. Maybe po put that in your resume so I could scroll through it. Um, although, honestly, that's a pretty bad presentation anyway. But that would be another thing I think is, you know, you, you need a dedicated portfolio, right, that, that deliberately shows us what, what you're best at. And oh, that, and that would I want to chime in with one more thing in terms of presentation. Um, you know, your images are important, your reel is important, uh, but a good quality presentation with without spelling errors, with reasonable formatting, even if it's simple, shows us that you have the attention to detail that it takes to not just bring your art skills to bear, but complete a project and close it out. Uh, so it's, it's pretty important. I mean, a great example is in, in the past, I know we've had students who go in for their portfolio reviews with one of these guys, and it's, their presentation's not loaded, it's not ready to go, or it breaks. Fair yep. enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, we're all artists, and we have to present our work. And ultimately, all we're doing at a game studio is presenting our work to people who are paying for the game. Um, and every day, that's something that we're conscious about, that we have to present our work to you. So when we're looking at uh, someone who wants to be on our art team, we want to know that they're, they have an eye for presentation, because that's only going to help us not just make a pretty model to put into a level, but how do you present that model, how do you present that UI, and make it appealing and make people want to get drawn into your game. And, and Sean, um, is it acceptable to show your own interpretation on a company's IP, or should you completely create your own? I think it's absolutely uh, fine to do that. Um, one anecdote I have is that uh, a woman named uh, Claire Hummel had done a bunch of Disney princesses, uh, historical Disney princesses. Um, we were struggling to find a look for Elizabeth at the time, uh, and we saw her artwork floating around, and we contacted her. And she ended up designing the student Elizabeth, the one with the white shirt and the, and the blue skirt, and the two Lutesses, the two red hair. Um, because on merit of us being interested in her, because she had done some Disney stuff. Now, it wasn't the only thing that she did. That got us interested in her, and we saw her entire portfolio and saw that she was a really, really good artist and that we really wanted to work with her. But that initial uh, interest level was because she had done something that kind of was making its way around the, uh, the Internet. And we do get a lot of submissions from people um, that do Bioshock stuff. Uh, the rare occasion, and this is really rare, it's not common, but we had one guy do a poster that was so damn good that we ended up putting it in the DLC just because it looked like it was, you know, we, we paid him for it, we wrote up a contract, we, you know, we got the rights to put it in the game, um, but that was an unsolicited piece of fan art. Um, so I think normally it's okay to do that stuff, but you got to have other things to back it up. It can't just all be um, copying other people's work or, or doing your own, your own thing on other people's work. I think it probably has to be really good, too, because, I mean, you're basically submitting work to a company that has been yeah. staring at this work for like three years. Yeah. So if, you know, you want your work to get scrutinized, I think it has to be good enough to hold up to that kind of, uh, you know, judging. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Wyeth, when should a portfolio be a real and when should it be a still? Mm. 
Um, well, anything that's animation based is a demo reel. So, you know, when you're talking about actual traditional animation, we have to see it in motion. Um, the other, you know, key part of that is visual effects. If you're an effects artist, we have to see your effects in motion. That doesn't mean stills aren't also interesting in those avenues because a lot of times when you think of traditional animation or you think of effects animation, you're actually thinking about the different states that those things travel through over the course of how they animate and how they resolve. And so thinking about it from kind of pose to pose, either as an explosion or as a traditional animation, like character animation, showing that progression and thought process is nice. Um, but for the most part, those need to be uh, video reels. For my money as well, and I've generally talked to, uh, to these guys about this as, uh, also, um, or environment work, we often get environment reels. I hate that. Uh, I want, just want to see really great still images of the environments that you've created. You can include a video fly through as well, but the, to me, the primary way that, to see the environments that people are making is through still imagery, uh, because there's you know there's this ability to see every little detail, to see that overall sense of aesthetic. It's not blurry, you know. There's not motion blur and camera artifacts kind of hiding things. So that's one of the things that may or may not be a little controversial, but I feel like that's a crucial component. Great. Gavin, when should my portfolio be as as broad or um, should it be more into specializing in given style and technique? Um, I, I would say specialization uh, over everything. I mean, when you're starting to make a portfolio and you're applying for like your first job or, or whatever, um, you should really be focusing more on quality. So like, rather than having, hey, I, I'm applying for a character art position, but I've got an environment, I've got a gun, I've got a car, I've got some concept art, and here's like a shader I made and stuff like that. Every one of those pieces is going to end up being weaker overall because you're not focusing all your energy on being the best character artist, being the best effects artist, being the best environment artist, and things like that. So, I mean, it's getting good first and then branch out to, you know, you have stylized art and realistic art or you have uh, some props like with your character or you have environment art. But it's first is, you know, like Wyeth was saying, quality first and then spread edit, out. Edit, edit, and edit again. I don't yep. know. <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then reduce your portfolio by half. Exactly. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was actually just talking about this the other night with, with somebody, and, and uh, they said something really interesting. Because uh, that's frequently a student thing, right? Like, not exclusively students, but typically it's like, okay, so I did this class sophomore year, I did this class junior year, mm -hmm. and they don't remove, right? Like, hopefully you're better your senior year than you were sophomore year. Um, so get rid of that stuff. But he, he said something very interesting. With it. You, while you're looking for a job, you have a job. Your job is to replace all of the work from college with new stuff. And I think that that's a really healthy attitude to have uh, for people who are graduating from school and, and looking to get in the industry. Like, while you're looking, you, you have a job, and that's replacing all of your student work. Yeah. Um, and, and, and a good approach to have, too. I feel like your portfolio is also kind of a representation of who you are as a person, too. Mm -hmm. So it should show, like, your your interests, what you really want to do, like what you could spend every day of your life devoting yourself to. And, I mean, with school, I don't think that's necessarily the case. It's like you're going to have a curriculum and you have to f yep. finish these courses and do whatever and get a good grade. Um, then after that is when you start finding your own voice and start being your own yep. identity, you know. So then, Wyeth, any particular standout, standout or failures in construction of a portfolio that you've seen? Well, I touched on the flash thing. I touched on the kind of Tumblr blog approach. You know, those are big ones that we see. Um, another one is, uh, it kind of piggybacks on what Gavin was talking about, but uh, lack of specialization, it can be really, really confusing for us where we're not getting the impression of what it is you actually want to do. You know, you're kind of, uh, we see this a lot with students, right, where you're, you're basically comparing yourselves to the, your peers around you, like in the class, uh, and you're kind of saying, well, you know, I'm looking at the people around me, and I can model character, and in fact, I think, you know, overall, maybe I'm stronger than the guys around me. What you're not doing is comparing yourself to the industry and to the people on, you know, the people without a job on poly count who are, or whatever who are just kicking ass, uh, and, you know, you're kind of, you're in your little bubble, and then what happens is, is you build your portfolio around that bubble where you're like, oh, I dabbled, I took a character art class and I created a character that was kind of compelling and so I threw him in there and then, well, I went and I did a tech art thing for a little bit and I learned how to write some shaders, so let me ram those in there as well. 
your point of view is dead <laughs> in that approach, right? Because it's this kind of five-spoked wheel, and we don't know, even, no matter what you say, oh, I'm applying for a character art position, if those other pieces are there, we, we, don't, we, we can't get your point of view. We don't get your taste level. Uh, and that's a, that's a, you know, at the end of the day, we're hiring somebody that has good taste, right? We're hiring somebody that we can trust to invent and create and take something like a rough sketch concept and go interpret it in a way that we think is going to be applicable to our game. We're looking at your taste level and we're looking at your kind of passion. That's what we need you to show us. You know, that's what, how you need to construct this, this portfolio and this, this house of cards that you're building. That's the thing we need to see. So the other thing that I want to touch upon is how all of you guys, as much as as many times as you're applying, continue to apply to a lot of these companies because you never know when they're going to need that person, right? Yep. So it brings me to Sean has some experiences with this. I, I like to offer up the rest of the panel to bring in their rejection letters <laughs> at, at some point. Um, when I first was trying to get a job in the industry, uh, I sent my portfolio as bad as it was everywhere all the time. Um, like I would go back to the same place every three months and just annoy the hell out of them, keep, keep sending it. And I got rejection letter after rejection letter after rejection letter, and I still have these at home just to remind me of how long it took for me to get a foot in the door. And no doesn't always mean no. No means could sometimes mean we're not ready for you yet, we don't have a position for you at this time. Um, there is an example of uh, someone I had met um, seen his portfolio, thought it was pretty decent, but I didn't have anything for him. There's, you know, we, we, it was for effects art. Um, a year later, literally, it was totally coincidence, we had just decided that day that we needed a, a effects art position open, and he emailed me the next day out of the blue. So that was, that's kind of like a feel-good affirmation, like coincidences happen. But the point for me there is that despite that it happened literally the next day, I was still going to call him. Like, he was still number one on my list because at, at that point, he is the best portfolio that I had seen. Um, so even though I didn't have something for him the year before when I talked to him, his, the quality of his work definitely stuck in my mind, and, and he was on my, my short list for, for getting in contact with. But... Sean, like, how did how did you keep going with that? Lots of alcohol and uh, <laughs> tears. Lots of Kleenex, right? <laughs> um, it, I I uh, I had a lot of good friends at Ringling that really pushed me um, mm -hmm. at the time, and I think I came out of that school with just a a, a very strong drive to never be satisfied. Um, and I think as artists, if you have that drive, that you know. You keep driving towards the next thing, like this isn't good enough, I want to do this, I want to try to make it better. You're going to get better, you're going to improve. And if you can improve at a rate that you can keep sending your portfolio out and don't worry about the mistakes you make, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, one of my teachers always said, you know, you had like 10,000 bad drawings and you just, you just got to get them out by practicing. Yep. Um, I mean, it's lame and cliche advice but I think you just you gotta just put your nose to the grindstone and keep doing it you gotta well, make good. sure you don't take it personally right like, mm -hmm. yes. like you are not your rejection work. letters are never they're, they're frequently they're almost always uh, you know it's a not right now not yes. no and it's not a critique on who you are it's your timing might be bad the company's timing might be bad um, the other thing is that companies are generally slower to react than you want them to, so things move at a little slower pace than yep. you'd want. But but I, I think not taking it personally and like just okay. The other thing is, if you completely replace your portfolio, I'm probably not going to remember. So it's like a fresh slate. So yeah. you know, I think that's good too. But you can't take it as as a personal slight, uh, and you just keep plugging away. You know, it's. Um, it's, it's, it's if if it's your dream, yeah. do your dream. <laughs> Don't you know? Believe in yourself. Surround yourself by people that that care and want to help you too. There, um, that's, there's that's also actually, the uh, there's one thing where I, mm -hmm. on the opposite of that, I, I after I got in a job at Looking Glass, I went to visit um, another company at the time. I can't remember the name. They're they're out of business now. But when I was talking to the art director, this was like two years after I'd sent my portfolio to him. He had one of my pieces stuck to his cubicle, and I was like, what? Like what? He's like, oh, I really like this piece, but it wasn't really what we needed for the company. So you still, you even get that side of it. Like people remember you and, and like the stuff, but sometimes 
the the company is your client, right? Like if you're you're not going to be sending super like hardcore, realistic Gears of War stuff to Media Molecule. So you kind of have to know what your audience is and what what that company is going to want to get out of you. Yeah, there's a there's a tan tangential thing in here too that I think is really important as well, which is that you guys are not capable of judging your own work. Nobody is. This is not exclusive just to people who are students or people who are trying to break in. We are not capable of judging our own work. You get better at it and you gain an instinct for what's working and what's not and that's kind of, the, as your skills increase, you start to be able to filter a little bit better. But that's, you know, this is the relationship we have with our companies all day every day is we make something and then somebody else comes in and tells us whether it's working or not because you just can't see it. You're too close. You're too myopic on it. You can't see it. So this is why the communities that are out there to support people who are up and coming like the poly counts or whatever, those are the most valuable thing. You can't filter it yourself. You need to put it out there to your teachers. You need to put it out there to other people in the community. You need to put it out there to your peers. Put it out there to, you know, even just send something to a company that you like and say, can you look at this? I'm not applying. Can somebody there look at this? They oftentimes will, and they'll give you feedback. I've done that before. Um, but you're not capable of judging your own work. You have to absorb that, put it in your soul, and just get, get the fear out of the way of showing your work and show it off as much as you can and get that feedback. So I'm going to ask this out to the group. Have any of you guys had a very successful candidate story, an applicant? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think... Well, I mean, I know that you we have hired some people looking at portfolios. Yeah, some, what was one that really stood out? Some things come back where, 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 you know, a guy uh, that we, we did a portfolio review, right? And then, like, a couple months later, um, you know, he had pretty good stuff. You know, it didn't happen here, just to be clear, like... No stress in the other room later. Um, but, uh, you know, he had good stuff, and he, he was looking for work once school graduated, and he contacted us again, and it just so happened we had a, um, an on-site contractor job, and I was like, hey, why don't you move out here and, and work for a year with us? And um, he came out, and we hired him uh, probably about three or four months ago. Uh, just worked out that a position came available, and he, kept, he was doing great work, and... And we kept him, you know. So it's a, it uh, it all happens kind of kind of kind of weird like that, you know. Um, it, it's it, it's just timing. A lot of cases it can be timing. I think to your point, Greg, though, like um, your point of contact, like that person made contact with you and you yes. saw his portfolio. He's probably making contact with dozens of other places. So you have all these irons in the fire, so to speak. So you're not just solely relying on on your one, you know the one place that I'm only going to work. You know, you, you really have to cast a wide net because you really don't know where these companies are uh, in their terms of hiring. Even what's on the website could be a month or two old because it has to go through so many people before a job listing even shows up on a website sometimes. Gavin, how important, important is it to be able to talk about your process and working in general when you're reviewing a portfolio? Um... I mean, I think it's. Uh, I mean, I think it's important to be able to be um, like knowledgeable about you know how you how you created something in your in your portfolio. I think depending on discipline though and like what you're actually showing, it's more important for some than others. And I know it kind of changes for like art director. Like maybe like Wyeth has one opinion and Greg has another. But for me, for character art, like I don't want to see speed sculpts. I don't want to see sketches. I don't want to see anything like that because it's not really showing your quality it's not showing you know what you do on a daily basis it's just kind of like work in progress and throwaway work mm -hmm. something you kind of keep in a folder and you, you're messing around with it but not really you know uh it's not something that will be making it to the game or anything mm -hmm. like that uh for concept art though for me that's what i would rather see for a concept artist because most of your job is going to be talking to the art director about getting an idea across. So you're banging out a bunch of different sketches, you're banging out a bunch of different ideas, and eventually one will make it, right? But for character art, that's not the, it's not the same, not the same deal. I think for a fact, it's, it's very much a process-oriented discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I get a reel, an effects reel, I see that as, as the beginning of, of a conversation between myself and a prospective artist. And when we have the, the first phone conversation, we talk about process. We talk about that iteration loop. I mean, you know, it's a very discipline-centric thing, but for effects, the, the loop between looking at a piece of work, making adjustments, 
seeing it back in context and then then going through that over and over again until you put together something that works within the confines of the game is the job. And so I want to be able to know that you can speak to that uh, and have a good understanding of what it's actually like with the, with the day-to-day operation and, and not just be able to go away, lock yourself in a room, and come up with something pretty that we you know, check into the depot and goes into the game. Now, you know, like I said, that's very specific to effects, and character art is, is a little bit different, but I just wanted to offer that different perspective. Mm-hmm. Also, chiming in on concept art, the word concept is in the definition of the job. Conceptualization is in the job title, and that's something that gets lost, I think, almost immediately when you're thinking about, oh, I want to be a concept artist. You're not an illustrator. You're not a painter. You're not, you're not anything other than somebody who is generating ideas who is an idea factory. And if we don't see the thought process of the ideas which leads to a finished piece, which, if you're talented, will also be maybe a beautiful illustration or a beautiful painting or you know, incredible line art or whatever, all that stuff is ancillary to why. Why did I draw the thing that I'm showing you? We have to know why. We have to know your brain cranking away, oh, these are my references, my inspiration, these are some of the silhouettes that I'm presenting. The why is crucial. Uh, and so that's, I mean, remember that the conceptualization is literally in the job description mm-hmm. there. For, uh, uh, for character art, I guess for the process to showing how you actually constructed it is important, though, like just to make that yeah. clear. So having good topology, having good UV layout, having an understanding of, you know, physically accurate materials and stuff like that mm. is definitely important. But, you know, how you come up with an idea as a character artist, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter to me. So why is you know, do you guys at Epic look at uh, other thing aspects of people's online presence when you're when applicants are applying? Everything that you do is fair game. Any way that you present yourself out in the world, whether it's on forum posts, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or your blog or even your personal blog because you really love brewing beer on the side, I'm going to go read it. Uh, if there's something about you out there that tells me your taste level, that tells you your passions, that you're interested, that you're not, uh, whether or not you're a dick <laughs> is really, really crucial. I mean, we have to be in a room with you for 40 plus hours a week. We, you have to be somebody that we're gonna, we think is passionate, that's hungry, that's talented. So, uh, yeah, anything is fair game, right? Uh, and your presence out there in the world is something that we're interested in. I mean, we, you know, we don't always go crazy deep, and we're not weighting that insanely heavily compared to whether or not you're a good artist. But if we're, if you're, we're on the edge, and you're somebody who's, well, maybe we'll take a chance, you don't have any experience, but your work is really great, but then we find your blog and you seem just not like a great person, we, it may just tip us just that far over to go, you know what, maybe we'll try somebody else. Maybe we'll dabble in, to, you know, take a risk a chance on somebody who doesn't quite, you know, we don't think is a cultural problem. So be aware that we are definitely looking at all of the ways you present yourself. I would would also warn everyone that the industry, despite what it seems like here on GDC, is very small. And that chances are you're a friend of a friend of somebody in a company and word travels fast if you're hard to work with or a difficult person. Um, we, We all talk to each other, so... It, yep. There's no reason not to have a, a good attitude about working. Well, and, and look, you know, like the, the, the online stuff, like we're not going to go look at your Facebook page, right? Like nobody cares about that. But, um, but when you're on Polycount or whatever, um, you know, it came up last year. I told a little story about how, like, we had, you know, we, we'd actually interviewed somebody. And, um, you know, at a certain point, some things maybe triggered that kind of caused us to, because I think we were discussing Polycount. Um, and so we actually went and looked at feedback, and um, you know, it, it, it wasn't favorable. Um, and uh, it wasn't that you know anybody's too blunt. I mean, anybody that knows me knows that that's really not a problem for me. Um, but um, but chemistry is important to the team, and um, and and you we all take that very seriously about the personalities we add. And so, uh, you know, it, 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 sparked a, it spurred a little bit of a conversational poly count. Um, and, you know, like, Gavin is, is you know, I, Gavin, mm-hmm. uh, um, it, it does more, he's more out there with his work than probably the rest of us on the stage. Um, and so he's, this is a guy who's doing it right, right? <laughs> like, like, he talks a lot, 
Which, and, you, and a lot of good Poss- stuff. Possibly too much. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but it's all, and it's all good stuff. But like you're, you're the example of, to me, uh, of, a, of a person who handles themselves uh, in, in an online mm-hmm. presence the way it should be done. Yeah. Right? Like, professional. I mean, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, like, at the risk of sounding too much like Kanye up here, um, <laughs> you've got to kind of look at yourself as a brand, right? Like, everything you're putting out there needs to reflect you as a possible employee or as a professional or whatever. And it's not like everything you ever say has to be like on point and super intellectual and, you know, I'm the, you know, smartest guy in the room or whatever. But, you know, it does, it's like Sean said, it's a super small industry. It's a quick search to see if someone is going to fit with your team. I mean, you're hiring the person as well as a great yeah. artist, you know, and you have to sit shoulder to shoulder with this person for years working on a game and you'll be stressed and all of this. So it's really important to always have that in your mind when you're you're giving feedback on a forum, like if you're a complete ass about it or, you know, if you're just always just railing on games or different people and stuff like that, it's it's gonna hurt you. Yeah, you definitely. can always be you can you can always be blunt and honest as long as you're being professional. Mm-hmm. Right? Like that's mm-hmm. at the end of the day you don't want to wake up and go, well, that, I probably shouldn't mm-hmm. have said that, right? And once you've tweeted it or you've put it on poly account, it's done. Mm-hmm. So something to think well, about. Well, I mean, you're working on a multi-million dollar product, right? And you want someone who's going to represent the brand and your company mm-hmm. respectfully and correct because mm-hmm. it's also a recruiting technique. So, yes, Gavin, you really, when you go out and you talk, <laughs> you actually aren't going and attacking people or making these random comments, you're actually being constructive and actually putting forth something for the industry to take away from. Mm -hmm. Because I think we all up here, the reason why we actually made are really trying to drive this home is for a reason. We have seen lots of problems online and don't think when you're applying people aren't checking. Mm -hmm. Fair enough? Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Okay. So, Steve, what are the... um, what area of game art production do you see more uh, demand than talent for right now? Uh, well, like I mentioned at the beginning, mm-hmm. uh, effects is definitely an area where I, I feel that uh, there's more demand than available talent. Uh, the other two areas that I would say are uh, UI, user interface, and uh, technical art. Um, I think Wyeth has a... a much better perspective on the the various types of technical <laughs> artists uh, that that are needed now. Well, it is interesting because it's fracturing now where you've got tech animators, and that's a job of you know, I'm rigging, I'm scripting in Mel, I'm making sure I'm supporting the people who are doing animation by giving them good bones and guts to work with and good tools. And then you've got kind of the shader side, which is hey, I'm making tech art that's relevant inside of the game engine itself, doing you know materials work or landscape work or blueprint work, scripting that visual scripting that kind of thing. And then you've got the kind of bones and guts underground tools guys, like I'm writing Python scripts for import-export pipelines, or I'm you know, getting really, really deep into the technical side of um, like tool support, almost, almost tooled programming, but not quite. Um, so that's three different things, and all of those jobs you could, you know, we will hire a great person immediately, and I know every other game company on the planet pretty much is the same way. I'm seeing uh, effects grow into much more than just uh, particle manipulation and mm-hmm. more into shader application for uh, glowing armor or shield bubbles. You know, in the case of Destiny, all, all of the space magic is is starting to get more and more um, like actual physical models with with interesting shaders applied to it, and that and that is a discrete skill, yeah. uh, which is the, becoming more and more important uh, as as the industry moves forward. Well, I'd like to take this time to, if anybody has questions, to take this opportunity and line up at the podiums, um, the microphones on the side, and while people are lining up, I'm going to ask one more question before we get to the Q&A section. Sounds good? So we're hearing a lot about art tests. Does anybody have any comments on that? I, I test everybody. So um, I... I believe it's important um, only because there's so many so many art thieves uh, out there. Um, it's showing commitment to the application. Um, it's showing how you can work uh, with a team at a very small scale. So 
handing something in, getting feedback from like an art director, like addressing that feedback and how you're going to respond. Um, but that being said, it's not uh, the way that I do it. Isn't testing literally everybody who applies. Mm -hmm. It's you know you get filtered down. You potentially are a good fit. You have a great portfolio. Um, get tested, and then you know basically start that process. Cool. Don't What's I would just add on okay. one thing. Don't be too intimidated as well if you, and we're the same way, everybody tests. I don't care if you're a 30-year industry veteran, everybody tests. But uh, there's another side of it too, which is um, don't be super intimidated if you get a test and it looks like the scope is way out of your comfort zone. Like, oh my God, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can do a whole character in two weeks or whatever they're asking me to do. Try, because a lot of times what we're doing is we're actually designing a test that's kind of too hard it's a little bit too tough for the, the parameters in which we're giving it to you because so much of the skill is cutting the right corners and showing us, well, you know, I wasn't able to model the whole guy, but I, did, I got half done and I did a symmetry modifier and did a little bit of extra stuff above and, and beyond that to, to show some asymmetry. And we're going to see, okay, they cut the right corner to finish the test, even though it wasn't exactly the parameters. So that's sometimes we're actually doing that intentionally. So don't Sounds get like crazy a Kobayashi straight. Maru. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. So let's begin the questions. Okay. Uh, so uh, you guys were talking about, you know, like internet presence and stuff. I was wondering, is there like an effect if someone lacks any kind of like presence in, on the internet? Um, I, I don't think that's any, as long as your portfolio is strong, it's not really, we're not hiring somebody because of Tumblr skills or <laughs> Twitter skills. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that it's, we're really looking for a solid artist. Uh, you know, the, yeah. the social media stuff can help, like if you have other work, like on your Tumblr site that we can flip through, uh, flip through whatever is fine, but it's, it's never a mark against you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Absolutely. Uh, one thing I've heard a lot is you should really tailor like your resume and your cover letter to the company you're applying for. But what about the overall portfolio? So like I I've kind of heard that you should have like a portfolio for this company and then a portfolio for this company and something like that. I, mean, I think you're probably going to burn out uh, <laughs> after a while. You know, I mean, for me, I would tell you to do what you really want to do. You know, like if you're if you really want to do stylized stuff, if you want to do like League of Legends art or, or something like that, but you're throwing your portfolio off to, you know, Activision or, you know, Naughty Dog or something like that, I mean, if you don't really want to do that day in, day out, eventually you're going to get tired anyway. So, I mean, I would, I would focus on the one thing that you want to do, make it as best as possible, and just hit up the companies that are in that, that wheelhouse, you know? Yeah, but the, the, the cover letter, I would, that's always nice. Yeah. You know, like you should, if it's a forum cover letter, it's kind of, so yeah, anything you say in there is always a nice little touch. Again, we don't get to that until probably the third or fourth thing I'm going to look at, but, but yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you. Howdy. Uh, I was just wondering, what is an effective way to present technical art, like materials and shaders and visual blueprinting and stuff? Is it, you guys were touching on whether to do a reel or whether to do stills, and I was just wondering on your opinion of, you know, effective presentation of technical art. Tech art is super broad, uh, so some of it is the the avenue of tech art that you're in. So you know, like if you're doing a rigging reel, you can, uh, even if you're just doing technical stuff, you're going to need to show the effects of that rig on deforming meshes. So we're going to need to see that stuff in motion, and then breakdowns of the offline stuff that goes around it. Like here, are the scripts I wrote or whatever, they're going to want to see that. When it comes to shaders, you know, we almost always want to see that stuff in motion. So I think uh, some stills showing, hey, here's some of the shader graphs, here's the logic, maybe here are the functions that I derived my math from. Here's some of the white papers that I read that inspired the, the tech that I'm, you know, doing in the game level itself. And then seeing it in motion uh, with some real samples uh, is, is probably the right thing to do. Um, you know, when in doubt, a combination of stills and video can work very well when you're really not sure if just one or the other is the right category for you. So I would say, you know, if something you need to see it in motion, do the video even if it's just for that section, kind of break it down piece by piece, and that's fine too. And we'll, we'll do the work of scrolling through it as long as it isn't crazy, you know. So, so just to add on to that, let's say you have a, you know, an awesome material or something, you just stick it on a cube. Does it, does it matter that it's not on, you know, the prettiest model or, you know, the, the best art, but it's an awesome shader or awesome material? 
presentation matters. So uh, if that would look better on a high quality model, find one from somebody else or download one. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, yeah. and then just make a note that says, look, this isn't my model, but look at how good the shader looks. We're going to want to see that. But also it shows us, oh, he's got good taste. He knows it would look better on a, on a 3D, you know, a character mm -hmm. rather than just on a sphere and you made that choice and you lit it and it has ni it's nice aesthetics and or whatever. So, you know, the presentation matters for sure. But if you're not a modeler, don't try to do it because, like, then we won't be able to get past the bad model. I, I, you know what I mean? Like, again, like, like you said, find one. That'll be the fly yeah. on the stick. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I think there's ways around it. Like, if you're doing, like, a skin shader or something like that and you just download a scanned head but you're applying for, like, a technical art position, no one's going to... No one's going to look at it as, wow, you modeled a great head. Oh, it's just a scan? Hmm, shitty. But, yeah. like, the opposite would be true. Whereas, like, I'm trying to do technical art, but it looks like garbage on a cube or something. Yeah. It's, just, you know, it's going to be bad. Like, all, all they'll be able to look at is that cube and not, you know, focus on what you're actually trying to show. And just make sure you're crediting other people's work so there's no confusion. Totally. Well, thank you. Hi, uh, you guys touched on... Um, on if you're planning for a character artist to put your character art or environment to just tailor per your portfolio to what you want to work for, um, what are your guys' opinions on? Because I've heard of about specializing to get it, and usually to, you want to specialize to get in a, a AAA studio. But if you want to work at a smaller studio, then generalist might be better because you'll be doing more things. What's your guys' opinion on that? I, well, I, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think overall that's a true statement. Um, the smaller the studio, the more hats you're going to have to wear. Uh, when once you get into you know 100 plus people working in a studio, then you have the luxury to really specialize, and one person can be really the best person at that one particular thing, and you, you just hyper focus on that one thing. Um, there's always exceptions to the rules, of course, but I think as a, as a rule of thumb, that's that ge I've generally seen that to be the case. The, the big thing is just edit, right? So if you're not really, if you took one figure drawing class and you have a couple of crappy figure drawings, you, we don't want to see those, <laughs> you know? It's like you have to edit and still yeah. show solid work in all those categories. Even 30 second gestures general. don't really, uh, don't really do it for us. Yeah, yeah, totally. So you just, again, you have to be able to edit and solid work in those categories. Even if you're trying to be a generalist, you have to make sure that they're elevated to a point where you're comparing yourself to the way that the quality of the industry. And pay attention to the job description itself. I think you want to make sure that if you are uh, putting together a portfolio for a specific description, maybe maybe you are looking at a description that says, hey, we want someone who can model and rig and texture. And then you can show proficiency in those, assuming you follow all the other rules. Um, but if you're, if you're applying to a larger company that is asking for specialization in the job description, that'll usually tell you, it's like, oh, this is the only thing that we want to see is this specific area. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm um, more I'm very interested in, into like doing game design, game mechanics, and I wonder if like at studios, do do they for game design and game mechanics, will people have a demo reel, or they people just submit more like, links uh, to their games, or how would that process work for more into game design? Uh, so industrial design. So, so like level design, or like game mechanics and things like that. Like, um, okay, I don't know if you guys more like know. gameplay and, and yeah, actual gameplay. design. Yeah, um, yeah. The the designer portfolio is is a bit of a black box. I mean, uh, when you're hiring a designer, you're looking at different things than looking at what we call architects or level builders, the people that are taking the art and constructing the space, keeping mindful of tactical considerations and line of sight and how it's going to stream in. Um, I mean, it, again, it's specific to what are, you, what are you trying to do. If you're trying to be a level builder that's going to construct worlds that the player can walk around in that may not necessarily be built out of the models that you have built, but you're placing the models in, you know, to create the world, I think you need to show those spaces even if it's a level we can download, because nowadays most uh, engines you can download for free and you I mean, have a package that you can load this level and walk through it, uh, or it, it can be a, uh, a fly-through. Um, 
Unless, of course, it's environment, art, and then wife will get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, good design really can only be experienced through play. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have something interactive. And that's just the be-all, end-all. You can't show good design in a video. It's just not possible. You can show good th theory, and you can talk about it in Flip Portfolio. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we can't put our hands on it, touch it, and play it, um, you, you know, that's, that's the end of the story. Also, I will say this. With art candidates, a lot of times they apply. And the, if they've passed the art test in the portfolio review, we're interviewing them, for the most part, as a culture fit. By the time they get it, they're, they're footing the door in the, in the building. You know, we realize you're a good artist. You've already tested. We like that. You passed those gates. With the designer, oftentimes we play and we experience what it is you've done. But there's a big component once you get on site of talking about your philosophy of design to the people in the room. And so those are, you've got to come prepared for both of those, uh, those things. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Hello. Uh, I was just wondering um, what do you guys look for in a level design portfolio? What stands out to you and what are things that shouldn't be done or, and or should? Uh, for level design, do you mean environment art or level design? Level design. Um, like building, building the level that will get arted up by an environment artist? Building a level, uh, gameplay and whatnot. Um, sort of similar to the last question, but just more clear. Uh, yeah, it is pretty similar to the last question. I think one of the we, we hired a guy on XCOM too that he had come in for an interview. First of all, he had actually like made a site that had dissected everything we did in XCOM Enemy Unknown and had like 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 sequence shots of like the level and 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 what was happening there. He had figured out all of our mechanics um, and then came in for an interview. As if that wasn't enough, came for an interview. Before we could even respond to him, he'd gone home and applied all the new mechanics we had added and made a totally different level and sent us basically a, a gray box of that. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a pretty good move. He was going to get the job anyway. But, yeah. <clears throat> but after that, it was like, there's no way we can't hire him. So, but, um, but yeah, so it's, it's a little bit different. I think you got to show your, kind of share your thought process as well with level design. Um, it, it's, a, it's a weird, it, it's a little bit of a weird one. And, and I've yeah. seen it done various ways. For instance, on Bioshock Infinite, when we were looking at level designers, we were very concerned, more, more concerned with how they could tell a story in the world than if they were good at like, setting up tactical space, because we had a design team that, would, you know, that, that they would work with when it comes to setting up tactical space. But we were much more concerned at that point with, can we bring somebody on that is good at telling a story of what ha has happened in the world. So we were looking at that specifically, not so much like tactical um, walk space and things like that. All so right. again, know your studio. All right, thank you. Uh, so you were saying that the uh, UI and technical art positions were less competitive than some of the other ones. So um, what would you say the uh, like specialties that are more competitive versus ones that are less competitive? Character art, yeah. concept art, yeah. character art. Those are pretty. Yeah, those are the pretty hard. Lots of uh, animation competition there. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's 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 again you look at the majors and schools and stuff and 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 where things tend to gravitate and, and it's just it's a broader stroke. It appeals to more people, I think. Um, and so, uh, I, and I also don't think people think about, wow, I mean, you mean I could actually do UI and motion graphics for a game? Um, I just don't think that that hits um, people that do that much, like graphic designers would, would be natural fits in a lot of cases. They just aren't thinking about games all the time. Uh, but, but again, modeling and uh, animation tend to be your, your kind of go-tos and, and concept, of course. Mm -hmm. But just the competition's more fierce um, because those jobs have existed longer. Mm -hmm. well, so. yeah, I think it's just like naturally, like a good UI, no one notices, yep. you know? Like everyone notices a bad UI. And paired with that, everybody wants to make monsters, you know? So if you can make a career <laughs> making monsters, you'd probably gravitate towards that, you know? It's not. Not many people are like, I can't wait to make health bars. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> uh, so uh, why if you were talking about uh, like a portfolio that you came back to uh, uh, because you like something about it? I was just wondering, have you guys experienced something similar? And did you eventually hire that person? And why did you come back? Why did you stay? What kept you 
kept checking out, updating. Well, so for me, it was somebody who was really, really good. It just, they, their reel didn't, you know, satisfied something that we didn't need at that moment. And usually in that case, I'll just put it into a special bookmark folder of people that are good that we don't need at the moment. Uh, and then every once in a while, go, you know, it's all deeply categorized by their specialty and what they do and when I found them. And it's all, I actually have a pretty good system for all of that. Uh, and so if there's something comes up, I'll go back and look through that. Uh, and so that was just a simple case of, oh, you seem really good. Maybe someday we'll need someone like you. Yep. Yeah, I mean, talent is talent. And when you see somebody who has a lot of talent, um, you take notice. You tend to remember them. Um, and similar to why I thought I have a, the same folder where I'll just keep dragging images or, or website links into this folder. That's kind of like my save for later. Uh, and if something comes up and we need a very specific role to be filled, then I have people that I've already kind of vetted, then that'll be my starting point so I don't have to start from scratch. Um, in the case of the person I said that we had hired a year later, it just, you know, at the time we didn't need an effects artist and uh, I his portfolio is really good. A year later, I had remembered it, and when an effects position became open, he was the first person I, I was going to call, and we ended up hiring him. But that was because you know it stuck in my mind. It was really like his work was good, and his process was good, and he knew what he was talking about. He was very uh, solid uh, foundation of what he was doing. So that that kind of stuck with me. So the best story I have for that is that I, we I had a guy I met at GDC. Um, I guess 10 years ago now. And um, uh, he was one of the IGDA scholars. And uh, we got to know each other. And um, he went off to work at a couple of different major studios and uh, kept checking on him every now and then. And uh, we had an opening up, open up about a year and a half ago. And so I called him up and I said, hey, uh, Morgan, you want to come, you know, interview for a job? And he's like, yeah, you know, I think, I think I'd like to do that. So a kid that I met, Nine years ago, I ended up hiring about a year and a half ago, and so it just worked out that way. What I needed was what he had actually gravitated to, and it was just a great fit. But yeah, it took nine years to get there, but we got there. <laughs> I had an applicant one time uh, that the timing just wasn't right, um, and but I liked him. We had a good conversation. Um, but there wasn't a good fit for the company, so I actually called up a friend who worked for a, another local studio uh, and, and pushed him over there, uh, totally self-serving. Uh, but a, a couple of years later, I called him up and said, hey, we have, we have a need for these skills. Do, do you want to come, want to come over? And, and uh, looked at his portfolio. It had been refreshed, all new stuff, and, and it was a pretty, pretty easy hire after that. Thank you. Uh, good day. Um, I just wanted to know, you were mentioning the Tumblr thingy uh, before. I was wondering if the, sa if the same rules apply to uh, websites like LinkedIn, for example. Do you guys check that out? Uh, do you have a LinkedIn account or something like that? I use LinkedIn. Um, I, I've had a number of applicants reach out to me through LinkedIn and, and show me their portfolios. I think it's a great tool. But it's not an art display yeah. tool, so all it is is a communication device to find people like us or hiring managers or whatever. So you still need a portfolio. You still need a dedicated website that is a portfolio site. I have two more questions. What would you call that art display tool? Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, the purpose for LinkedIn is to be just a, uh, an online resume, right? Yeah. And anything beyond that would be like your portfolio, your art station page, something like that, where it's specifically just art content, just your best work. Okay. And then the final question is uh, going back to the generalist versus specialization. Uh, when you work on a on a big studio, my guess is that you also have big uh, a very open line of communication with your programmers, your directors, and stuff like that, right? Ideally. So, yeah, <laughs> hopefully, right? So, my question would be, wouldn't it be more efficient if someone that, apply, that has many skills show you that he can do, well, I can do 3D art, but due to, you know, my situation, I can also do 
uh, let's say programming and stuff like that. Normally, when you're when a big company is hiring for a position, they have a very absolute need for that position. Yep. So let's say character art. We need a character artist. It's great if a character artist comes in that can do effects and concept art and other things, but we don't want to see that until we see that your your character art portfolio is amazing, and we want to hire you for that. Mm-hmm. So the, would, the rest is just okay. bonus. Right. Okay. So you wouldn't communicate to say your programmer is like, and he'll be like, hey, by the way, I need a new programmer because last one got sick or had a crash or something. Nope. No. No. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, I was wondering if any of you have any advice for people trying to cater their portfolios to studios that are NDA, NDA and uh, haven't released their title yet, specifically for art position, possibly tech art if it's more art oriented. Wow, that's a, yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Uh, um, so you haven't seen anything that they're doing. You don't you, like you don't know what it is yeah. that they're kind of doing. Um, that's that's tough. I mean, again, I would just put together your best work, put put together what you think is good, what you enjoy doing, and if it's not a fit, they're probably not going to call you back. But it, but yeah. if it's a fit, and you you wouldn't want to be there anyway if it wasn't. So yeah. um, you know, you're kind of shooting in the dark a little bit, but you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, showing a strong point of view for what you want to do all day, every day, is about probably your best bet at that yeah. point. When we were staffing up for Destiny and we hadn't shown anything about the game to the world, we were still, like, we needed people. It was a big game with a lot of work, but we couldn't tell people what we were working on. Um, but generally, people who were applying were familiar with our previous titles and were, and were delivering portfolios that were kind of in line with, with the nature of work that we did anyway. Uh, so even though it's a little bit of a black box, you can kind of look to a company's track record and, and try to cater to the company rather than the project. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And at that point, would it be okay to t- take a step back if you weren't sure, like for Bungie and Halo and whatnot, um, could you take a step back and be a little bit more generalist with what kind of art that you show in your portfolio? Mm-hmm. Would that be all right? Or is it better to just... I think, you, I think you could probably you could probably even guess too. I mean, with Bungie, even though Destiny's a million times different than than Halo, right? right? I mean, I think you could probably guess that it's going to be in that realm of a game, right? Versus like, you know, um, you guys are making the new Skylanders or something like that. You know what I mean? It's like absolutely completely different. Like, I yes. I think it's kind of rare for a company to take such a hard a hard turn we, from what we wouldn't have gone with. completely left turn and go cell shaded yeah. funny animal games yeah. so no Snoopy game huh <laughs> no uh, although I would, I'm fond of the Snoopy uh, so you know again it, it's, a, it's a matter of like sort of checking out what the wheelhouse of that particular company is and, and, and sort of driving towards that mm-hmm. due to time we can only take one more question Thank you. Thank you. So that is you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello. Um, as was mentioned just a couple minutes ago, um, character art is extremely uh, hard to get into. Uh, what can a prospective character artist do to make their portfolio as competitive as possible? I'll oh, ask go to you. Oh, all right. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's uh, essentially what we've been saying, like all, you know, the whole hour. Um, I mean, it's just quality, it's self-editing, it's um, having every piece that you you have being something that you're really, really proud of. Um, I mean, to give you a rough stat, um, I have an opening for my company, and I've had 500 plus applicants. So you get a lot of people. I mean, you get concept artists, you get like just sculptors, you get everything like just coming in. So there's a lot of noise, and you like you really have to stand out. And like, what will make you stand out is not being obnoxious, it's being like you're professional, your work is really solid, it's hitting you know, modern technology it's looking like it should be on Xbox One, PS4, or something like that, like it already fits Um, because I mean you're competing with everybody, you know, it's competing with your class, you know Well, thank you guys very much for this, and um we're really excited to be doing this talk, and we hope to be here again next year. Yeah, please be sure to fill out your form or your online forms, whatever. Mm-hmm. It. And also, we'll be doing our portfolio room uh, reviews in the next room, 132, which is that way. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see you there. Thanks.